Welcome to the Alcohol Tipping Point Podcast. I'm your host, Deb Maisner. I'm a registered nurse, health coach, and alcohol-free badass. I have found that there's more than one way to address drinking. If you've ever asked yourself if drinking is taking more than it's giving, or if you've found that you're drinking more than usual, you may have reached your own alcohol tipping point. The Alcohol Tipping Point is a podcast for you to find tips, tools, and thoughts to change your drinking. Whether you're ready to quit forever or a week, this is the place for you. You are not stuck and you can change. Let's get started. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Alcohol Tipping Point podcast. I'm excited to have on the show today, Rebecca Bex-Weller. She is a former party girl turned health and life coach, author, and speaker. She is also the author of the best-selling sobriety memoir, A Happier Hour, as well as the books Up All Day, Chameleon, Confessions of a Former People Pleaser, and RSVP Sober, your guided journal for socializing alcohol-free. Bex has also been an alcohol-free badass since 2014, and I'm excited to have her on the show today because she is one of the original people who really started the sober curious movement and just made it cool to be sober. She has been known for her program, Sexy Sobriety, which is no longer available, but I know that it was popular for a lot of people. And I am just looking forward to hearing about more tips from her about how to socialize confidently when you are sober, because I know it can produce a lot of anxiety for people, and it also can be the trigger that gets you drinking again. So thank you for listening to this episode. Well, Bex, I'm so glad you're here. I feel like I know a lot about you, but maybe our listeners don't. So I would love for you to just skip an intro and share how you've been on this journey. You know, I know you've been alcohol-free since 2014. And here we are 2014 when this airs, not 24, 2024. <laughs> That's going to be hard to get used to saying. So you're going to be approaching 10 years yeah. of sobriety, right? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you so much, Deb. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And you know, my, my journey with alcohol, it really began, like, I think so many of your listeners can probably relate to in that I started when I was a teenager. I was a very shy and introverted soul, and I, I liked that alcohol made me more talkative, more outgoing. And it was because of that that I really fell in love with it. It was really that social lubricant from the very beginning. And throughout the years, like I really started to drink a lot whenever I was socializing. And I could not imagine ever going to any social event without alcohol. <laughs> you know, we'll talk so much more about that today, I'm sure. But like it, I would drink before I would go to an event and then I would drink myself silly when I was there. And quite often, especially as the years progressed, I would have blackouts and I wouldn't remember what had happened at, at social events. And this was a real problem because when I was out with colleagues, like I was mortified walking into the office again on Monday, not knowing what I'd done or what I'd said on Friday night. And when I was out with just like groups of friends, I would be so embarrassed the next day that I would avoid them and not want to see them again. So I found myself really moving from group of friends to group of friends and trying to keep it on the down low, thinking that I was so clever that I was being stealth about the fact that I was drinking too much and that no one would notice if I just dropped out of the social scene for a little while and hung out with these different friends instead. Like really, when I think back to it, it was flippant, exhausting. <laughs> and I, you know, kept drinking throughout the, throughout the years. And I found myself in careers and with companies who had a lot of budget for socializing, where there was a lot of drinking involved as well. And so my binge drinking really became worse. And it got to a point in around 2012, 10, and I started to become a lot healthier. Like I started to become really intrigued by nutrition and how it makes us feel better and how it makes us uh, think more clearly. And the funny thing was, is that I started down this path of getting healthier that way, but I still was 
drinking heavily, like on the weekends. And eventually I decided that I was going to just on a whim and a prayer, leave the corporate world and embark on a new career as a health coach. You know, the, the irony that I still was binge drinking didn't really occur to me back then. It was kind of a normal thing. You would see a lot of, I mean, even now you see a lot of like yoga and wine classes, things like that. And so it was this mixed up sort of paradigm. And when I actually launched into this um, health coaching world, I remember I had a beautiful session with one of my coaching clients and we were sitting in a Skype session and we were looking into each other's eyes. And she said, you know, sometimes when I, when I feel lonely, I drink more. And I said, well, that's okay. Because of course, to me, like I wanted to convince myself that it was okay. But the minute the words left my lips, I knew that it wasn't. I knew that it was not okay to mask our emotions with alcohol or any other addictive um, pattern or substance. And it was from there that I started to embark on this journey of sobriety. Like I started reading blogs about these women. And back then these were all anonymous because it was very difficult to find anyone talking publicly with their name and face attached about, about sobriety. And so I read these blogs and these blogs really inspired me. Like these women were saying that their lives were better without alcohol. It was so difficult to believe. Like it was so, so out of the norm. I didn't know anyone who didn't drink and was happy about it. <laughs> and it just sparked that seed of inspiration where I was like, okay, what if I just try like a three month experiment and see if my life is better? And so I embarked on that and lo and behold, my life got better. <laughs> and I got to that three month mark and I thought, well, if, if my life is better now, what if it would be better in six months? Like, could it be even better? And so I moved that goalpost and what do you know, it got even better. <laughs> and this path led me to want to share all of everything that I'd learned. Like when I got to seven months sober, I was so excited about how different my, my life was and how everything I'd ever feared was actually not relevant. Like it, I was so afraid of sobriety and yet in sobriety, I gained everything I'd ever wanted. And in wanting to share this, like I, I decided I'd create this <laughs> sobriety program. And so my business partner and my husband and I put together this sobriety program called Sexy Sobriety. And that program, like it really started with this little seed of inspiration and it took on a life of its own. And from there, I wrote my first book, A Happier Hour, and <laughs> three more books after that, all on the topic of sobriety. And that brings us really to today. Like I've been doing that work for those nine years now and coming up to 10 years in March of 2024. Wow, that's wonderful. I mean, I just want to thank you because like you and, I, you know, there's been a, a handful of women have really led the way for this like sober curious movement. And I just kind of think of you as one of the originals. <laughs> oh, really? You know, like you helped re-energize sobriety, like sexy sobriety, like the name says it all, like you just made it so appealing and so wonderful. And that has helped like take a lot of the shame and stigma out of just giving up drinking, which a lot of people, you know, maybe don't have a traditional problem or identify as an alcoholic or whatnot. And I don't even use that terminology, but I think you just made it cool to be sober and sexy and all of that good stuff. So thank you so much oh, for your work. Thank you so much. It means the world. And, you know, my husband actually came up with that name, Sexy Sobriety. I was like, oh, really? And he's like, come on. Like up until now, sobriety has seemed so somber and depressing and, you know, boring. And we really need to make over to say like, it's a hell of a lot sexier to be sober than it is to be, you know, drunk and falling off the couch at a party type thing, which is where I was at the time. And so, you know, thank you for recognizing that because that was one of our biggest purposes was to try to give it a bit of a revamp. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You sure did. 
And then one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because this is coming out during dry January, and a lot of people are going to be socializing. And that can be one of the scariest things to do. I, I know for me, it, it I would always lead me back to drinking, you know, and, and it's just, it's hard. It's really hard to be around a group of people and feel like you're the odd one out or whatnot. And I had was sharing before we started recording that you were on the Sober Holiday Summit and you were talking about socializing sober. And my friend texted me and she was like, I'm listening to Bex Weller. This is so good. And then later she sent me her screenshot of her notes and she had taken like a whole whiteboard of notes about all your tips and they were so, so good. So then I saw that you had written the book RSVP Sober, your guided journal for socializing alcohol free. So who better to have on the show to talk about <laughs> how do we do this, right? So so <laughs> yes. I it's like, where to even begin? Like, I guess, where do you think we should start? This is the big topic. Yes. Oh my gosh. I have so much to say on this because I totally understand and I totally feel anyone that is nervous about socializing sober. It was my biggest thing about how do you, do you hang out at parties? Like at the time I was this big party girl. Like I was always known as the woman first at the bar, the woman trying to get everyone to have a good time. And the last one to leave, unfortunately. And to change that identity was so scary and so tricky. And, you know, I think that one of the scariest mo moments of socializing alcohol free can be that first time or that first moment of walking into a party or a gathering. And, you know, once upon a time, I believed that alcohol equaled confidence. Like that was why I was first in line at the bar every single time. I believe that alcohol equaled being feeling carefree and being able to talk to people. But if there's one thing that comes up time and time again in my work helping women to live alcohol free, it's that true confidence really comes from within. And that the longer that we go without drinking, the more confident we feel in every situation. So taking those first scary steps, doing things for the first time, each time we do that, we grow and we grow in confidence because we realize, hey, I can actually do this. But the first time I went to a, an event with colleagues and didn't drink and I came out of there and I was elated. I was so proud of myself. I was like, oh my God, I can go out and have, and have a good time and not drink. And that only comes through practice. So a fun way to get started with all of this action building confidence is through some confidence hacks. And two of my favorites, like these are little tricks, little secret things that you can do to help you. The first one is to wear a lucky charm. So in early sobriety, I had a bracelet and on the inside of that bracelet were, was inscribed the words, stay here. And this was something that I bought from Belle Robertson from Tired of Thinking About Drinking. She had a, a little jewelry store with things that we could use to act as a, a talisman or a token, something that was a, a, a charm with you that reminded you. And wearing this bracelet, every single time I felt like I should drink or I felt freaked out that I wasn't drinking, I would just look down at this bracelet on my wrist and no one knew what was written inside. No one knew it had engraving on the inside, only I did. And it just felt like this little precious secret with myself of like, stay here, stay on the sober side. You've got this, you can do this. Because I mean, let's face it, the sobriety is not for the faint of heart, right? And, and ob wearing an object that you believe is lucky, it can just boost your confidence and make you feel all the more likely to succeed. It helps to remind you that, hey, I've got my own back. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm present. I've got, my, I've got this. <laughs> the other one that I really love to use is aromatic anchoring. So emotion, emotional essential oils, they can really support emotional balance. They can bring a sense of calm and feelings of well-being. And so what I used to do with this aromatic anchoring was sit before I would go to a social event put some essential oils on me or put it in a diffuser around me, breathe in deeply 
and imagine how I wanted to be at these social events. Imagine myself walking through them, feeling completely confident, smiling, laughing, feeling relaxed and happy, not drinking. And then I would take that essential oil with me into a party. Sometimes I'd wear it as perfume. And then whenever I felt freaked out, I would just raise my wrist and just smell that essential oil. And it would remind me of that meditation I'd done earlier. It would remind me of that visualization of who I wanted to be. It's just a way to use your senses to bring you back to the present moment so that you don't get freaked out with thoughts of what's happened in the past or fears of what might happen in the future. You visualize yourself socializing like a sober rock star and it tends to come true. I also would take a small bottle of it in my handbag so that if it all got too much at an event and I just needed a timeout, I could go out into the garden or I could go into the bathroom and I could take out my little essential oil and take a deep breath and smell it. And again, just return to that, that vision, that intention of who I wanted to be. I love those. I, I, I think that's so strong, the association with different smells and whatnot. I know that sometimes there's like this laundry detergent or something that the hospitals use and I will smell that and I will think of when I had my babies and they gave them these little hats but I mean it's just like it it's the power of using your senses and then tying it into visualization and then the whole confidence building the lucky talisman the little charm those are really cool <laughs> so what think what what are some ways that we go about getting this idea wrong this idea of socializing sober like what are we doing that's wrong <laughs> i think the number one thing is that we believe it would be miserable and gosh did i think this gosh i thought that it was going to be the worst time ever that i would just be miserable for the rest of my life i thought no one would invite me anywhere i'd never have fun again and i'd never be fun again like I really just could saw my life in just gray for the rest of my life. And it's funny because it's not that way at all. In actual fact, like the highs become higher and the, the colors become brighter. Like it, it really can be so much better than you believe, but it will change. And that can be terrifying at first, but it actually is a beautiful thing to look forward to. So you know, one thing I, I always like to say is like, what if it's better than you ever imagined? On day 30 of my sobriety, I celebrated my 39th birthday. <laughs> so it was the last birthday of my 30s. I was exactly 30 days sober. And I, for the first time in as long as I could remember, for the first time since I'd been a teenager, I celebrated my birthday sober. So not out with dozens of friends dancing on tables and getting carried away but like actually just a sober birthday that just felt really chilled. And it was just so nice. Like my, my love and I, I said, to, he said, what do you want to do? Like, how would you like to celebrate it as something different? And I thought it over and I said, you know, on the day, I just want to have like watch a, an 80s movie, have my favorite food, have a sparkling wine in a, in a fancy goblet, have some fancy chocolates and just chill out. And later I had a, a, a party with friends that was just a, like a, uh, a morning tea type thing. Like a, they all came over, we sat on the rooftop and it was just chilled. It wasn't the like crazy nights of the past. And I thought I would miss that. But in actual fact, it felt so nice just to be relaxed, just for it to be so calm and peaceful and just quiet, like happy fun. and this wasn't a once off, like this belief that it would be miserable. I thought that it would be all the way through. So as I made my way through a year of sober firsts, through my first sober trip, my first sober summer, Christmas, New Year's, it blew my mind that I preferred it more. Like I, I couldn't have even fathomed that this could be the case. And you know, I always think that if someone had asked me why I was so afraid to go to events sober, I would have said, because it'll be boring if I don't drink. I never stopped to consider why was I going to all these events that were so boring I had to drink to get through them. 
Like, why am I going to these events that are boring without alcohol? Like, what if I did events that were fun without alcohol? How about that? <laughs> and so I think like approaching it from a different direction. And, you know, now I, I have so much fun with friends. Like we go and we do other things like I, besides, you know, not the old drinking and pops and things, but we go and uh, we do hula hoop lessons in the park and gosh, we just laugh our asses off. <laughs> we go and do like, we go to funny movies. We go to, you know, our art exhibitions. We go to a ton of different things that are fun and interesting without drinking. And so I think like approaching it with a mindset of like, what could it be like if I was just open to it? How could this be like, what, what if it's like a whole new chapter where I learn something new? Because if you think about it, we have a ton of experience of drinking, of doing the same old things, going to the same old places, the same old parties with the same old people and having the same results. <laughs> and so what could it look like if it was something new and different and, and something that expands our world? I think so often when we've been drinking for a long time. We believe it's expanding our world, but in actual fact, it's making it smaller. I know when I was drinking too much and then blacking out and avoiding people, it was making my life smaller. You know, it was, I was, I was shrinking. I was, I was avoiding people. I was avoiding situations. But to expand in, in life and be like, what new adventures could I discover is just so, such a different direction to that and something that can be just so precious and valuable. Like, until you experience it, I think it's hard to understand. And that's why I am so adamant about go and experience it. Don't take my word for it. Go find out for yourself. <laughs> I think that's such a good reminder too, like figuring out what you actually like to do and what are you just tolerating and, and realizing like, maybe I'm just tolerating this with drinking and I don't really like this or yeah. And you're right. Just like going to a bar and sitting there can get kind of old. I, I remember I had somebody on the show and he was saying how he and his wife would travel to different cities, but they would just go to bars in different cities and they'd never explore the city. And, and now that he was alcohol free, he's like, we are going to go back to these different cities and like actually explore because your world had gotten so small and revolved around drinking. And yeah, I totally get it. I love so, that so much. And I always talk about like reclaiming um, places. Like I think about that too. When I go, there's a place down south from here where I live and it's Wine Valley. Like they, you know, it's called Wine Region. And all of my times there have been very messy. <laughs> I'll put it that way. So I often say like, I'm going down there to reclaim it. And exactly like that example of like going to do other things in that region that is not just like alcohol focused. Yeah, I love that idea of reclaiming too. Yeah, so fun. Well, I kind of feel like it also gives you a chance to experience ordinary things in a different way again. Like you were saying, like your first sober Christmas, your first sober wedding, your first sober concert. It's kind of like being a kid again. Like, <laughs> oh, like the kids don't need alcohol for these events and they're having a blast. So it's, it's really cool. Exactly. So with some of the challenges, let me ask you about one of the the challenges of, of just feeling left out and not fitting in. I think that can be a big challenge for people, that whole FOMO. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, for sure. You know, there's a concept that I learned when I was studying to be a health coach at IIN, and it was called the concept of fitting out, where it was like, Instead of trying to fit in with everyone else and be carbon copies of, of everyone around you, what if you just decided to celebrate your differences? What if you just said, I'm just going to fit out? And this, it was, it, when the time that I had learned about this, it was a time when I was like eating a bit more healthily. I was definitely like departing a little bit from the mainstream. And it felt like such an exhale, like such a a relief and permission to accept yourself as you are and not try to fit in with everyone else. Because when you think about it, I mean, isn't it crazy that we still feel peer pressure past the age of 16? Like it's pretty nuts. And also how boring life would be if we were all exactly the same. Like imagine all of your friends 
and the different things that they bring to your life. One is super funny. One is really clever. One gives you great advice. Imagine if they were all exactly the same, like how boring life would be. And so you don't have to be the same as everyone else either. And, you know, I always think about FOMO as it's usually driven by a fear of missing out because you believe that everyone else will be drinking and having a better time than you. Like that's usually what, what drives it, right? That you think that your option is boring or deprivation or punishment. You fear that you'll be missing out on some special thing and you feel envious that others can do it while you struggle to be good. That's usually where this fear of missing out is coming from. You don't fear missing out on you know, taking the garbage out. <laughs> you don't fear Never. missing out on something that's not fun. You fear missing out on what you believe is fun. And this fear is so misplaced. Like you're not really scared you'll miss out because if you think about it, you can still go to everything you're invited to. You're, so you can still laugh with your friends and dance yourself silly. What you're really scared of is that everyone else will have more fun than you because you still believe drinking is more fun than sobriety, which means that it's not your friends or your invitations that need to change necessarily. It's your mindset. And a brilliant way to reframe this is to make your option more fun. <laughs> and this was a trick that I learned in the beginning because gosh, did I used to mope about some events because I believed that everyone else would have more fun than me because I wasn't drinking. And so I realized in order to take my power back and not feel like I uh, not have a pity party or not feel like a victim, I needed to make my own choice more fun. I was like, okay, how do I make not drinking the most fun it can be so that I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything? I don't feel like I'm missing out at all. And so one of these ways is to invest in upgrades. So if you are going to an event with friends, you might be going to the theater or something like that. You might want to invest in better seats or better tickets. If you're going to a restaurant or some kind of um, food event, you might want to upgrade your food options by choosing a nicer restaurant or ordering a nicer meal. Or if you're going to stay with friends over the holidays or you're going to a wedding that's a, a big event, you might want to upgrade your accommodation, your room or your hotel, because you'll really notice and appreciate all these little changes so much more now that you're sober. Like when I was drinking, if I went to a party and a friend said, oh, you can just sleep on a mattress on the floor, I would have been happy with that as long as there was alcohol. Like my standards were pretty low. And once you stop drinking, you're like your standards become higher because you're fully conscious. So lean into that, like really have fun with it and see how you can make it more fun. So you might want to also, like if you're going to an event, you might want to have little special touches with you when, when you go, like the things we've talked about, like the essential oil perfume and the, and the lucky charm. You might also want to have treats waiting for you when you get home to celebrate how courageous you've been and how and just reinforce those patterns of behavior that sobriety can be fun. So you can put fresh sheets on your bed before you go so that you have something lovely to come home to. You can set up a little cupcake for yourself for when you get home. You can set up candles or fresh flowers. You can have a new book. Um, you can also set up new sublime treats for the next morning. So things like uh, a sunset, a uh, sunset, sunrise walk with friends or a um, a visit to the beach or a morning yoga class or some creativity event or class. You can set up little treats for yourself so that you make your option more fun. And, you know, also there's things like wearing your favorite outfit, something that makes you feel good. There's all kinds of ways that you can really get creative with this. And, and I really encourage you to explore this and make a list as well of like all of your fun ways to, to, to have more, enjoy it more. Because the more you focus on you, making your option more fun, the less you will have FOMO, the less you will care about what everyone else is doing because you're having the best time ever. <laughs> well, I'd, I'm appreciating all these like really practical tips. They're, they're so helpful. I, I love a good practical tip. 
What about, you know, when your challenge is other people, like if your trigger is other people, like say you're doing a, a family social event, you're kind of obligated to go to, or you have like drink pushers or, you, you know, that mm. kind of thing. What are some ways we can manage? Yeah. I mean, this can be really tricky, especially in the beginning. And I found it so difficult to know what to say. And the more we do it, the better, the easier it becomes. And I really believe that the more confident, happy, and joyful you are in your own choices, the less likely people are to peer pressure you. Like if you seem like you're really owning your choice and you have unshakable confidence, people won't question it. They're like, oh, okay, she knows what she's doing because she's totally happy with not drinking, you know, <laughs> rather than if you say, oh, I can't drink or I wish I, wish I could, people will then want to alleviate your suffering like there's a part of them that will want to convince you that yes you can like come on just have one but if you are you go into an event and you're like oh no thanks not for me and you're totally happy with that they're less likely to peer pressure you because they're like oh okay she knows what she wants <laughs> and a tactic that can really help with this is to switch your comments from something negative to something positive so rather than talking about what you can't do Talk about what you can or will do. This is a great way to just shift the energy and shift the focus and help them to, to realize, to stay focused on the positives as well. So rather than saying, oh, I can't stay late, you say, oh, no, I can stay until 9 p.m. <laughs> or rather than saying, I can't drink tonight, you say, I'll have a club soda. You're just focusing on the positives. You're focusing on what you can do or what you will do. And this can also relate to like, if there's an event that you really don't want to go to because you feel like it would jeopardize your sobriety. And some events are like that. Um, you know, deep down, if, if you think there's absolutely no way I'll get through that without, without drinking, you can avoid that event. So then if people ask you, oh, are you going to this event? You can say, oh, I'm not, I can't make that one, but I can make this one. And you shift the focus to like, do you want to come to this one? This one's going to be really great. And it just helps to like move the conversation on, focus on the positive, help everyone to think that you know what you want, you know that, and you're happy and confident in your choice. You don't need saving. <laughs> you're, you're, you're moving towards the, the, the reality that you want. And you know, it's entirely possible that your friends may never have seen anyone living happily alcohol free before. I hadn't before I stopped drinking. So show them how fun sobriety can be. <laughs> like think of yourself as a game changer or a rebel or a trailblazer. <laughs> One other mindset trick that I always love to employ is this will either be fun or funny. And I use this especially at family events <laughs> because they can be the most tricky. <laughs> and I go into them and I think, you know what, this, this event will either be fun or funny. I made up my mind and that's how it will be. There'll be no tears today. <laughs> And so then if, you know, everyone has a good time and no one bugs you about your sobriety, you're like, great, fun. If Uncle Barry gets on his high horse and tells you that you should be drinking because one drink a week is good for the heart or whatever, whatever else nonsense, you can just decide to view it as funny. You cannot let it, you can decide not to let it impact you or throw you off your intentions. You can just be like, wow, that was funny. <laughs> And just those little mindset shifts, it, it, it alleviates your stress and just makes you feel more confident and just gives you that quiet courage that is so necessary and so delicious in early sobriety. Thank you. Thank you. Those are fun or funny. I love that. Yeah. And then say you're there and you have a craving, like what are some of your tips to manage drinking cravings? I think, you know, so often the, the feeling of having cravings, it still is wrapped up in that feeling that your um, option is not more fun. And, you know, something I used to do when I was at events and I would get a craving was really go, go out to the garden, go out to the bathroom, go somewhere and just take a breather because, you know, a, a temporary emotion can come over us where we're like, oh, I'll just grab a drink or no, we'll no, or, you know, those sort of little, that little addictive voice pops up in our head. And I would go and take a breather and just be like, no addictive voice. At the time I called it the beast, no beast. <laughs> you will not be just grabbing a drink. 
I'm going to like think about what I want my future to be like, what I want this sobriety experiment to feel like, what I want to learn about myself. And just coming back to that intention just was just so soothing and calming. And after like taking a few deep breaths and visualizing that, I was able to move forward in a better way. And so often, you know, craving, self-sabotage, they they can come about from different angles. Like it can come about when you're actually at an event and taking that breather is a great way to to alleviate that. They can also come about through social media. <laughs> in this day and age, like social media can be such a huge trigger, especially in early sobriety. I remember in early sobriety, I decided not to go to one event because I thought it would be too tricky for me. And then I made the rookie mistake of scrolling through my Facebook feed instead like sitting at home while the party is going on and scrolling through my feed. This is a big mistake. <laughs> if anyone has ever done it before, you know what I mean. My feed was filled with the photos of the best party ever. And I thought I had missed it. I thought I was such a fool. Like, what was I doing? Why was I sober? Why was I wasting my life? Like, this is all the things that were came up. I'll never have fun again. You know, all these fears and all this nonsense came up in my head and I moped about the house wondering what my life had come to. And in that moment, I really wanted to drink. I, I thought, this is ridiculous. Like, why am I not drinking? It was only the next morning when a friend called that I learned that those photos had been taken well before 10 p.m., <laughs> well before several of my friends had gotten into a heated argument, well before a couple of them had left in tears, and well before the soul-crushing hangovers had set in the next morning. and. It was just a snapshot in time. It didn't tell the full story. And so that trick of like playing it forward to the end of thinking, sure, you know, for an hour or so, it might have been jovial and it might have been fun, like the photos looked. But that doesn't tell the whole story. That doesn't show all of the other things that go wrong after that or how all the wheels come off and it gets super messy. You know, you kind of mentioned self-sabotage. And I think along these lines would be if someone slips up or they have a set, how, what is your advice for managing setbacks? Managing setbacks. I really believe it's about getting back on that horse. <laughs> it's about not beating yourself up. Like we have so many beautiful members throughout the years in sexy sobriety who had to start their journey over. And I really believe that setbacks can provide such a beautiful learning experience. They really give us a chance to reflect on what we've been doing well and what we, you know, could work on a little bit more. Like often they are a messenger that teach us okay, what do I need to strengthen in my support kit, in my toolkit? Like, what do I need to focus on to help me reinforce my sobriety? And so often you can go back and think about, okay, like, am I looking at my mindset? Am I making my choice more fun? Am I playing the tape forward? Am I thinking about like, the entire picture, like we were just talking about with social media? Like, am I looking at everything that happens in drinking and could I have more fun in different ways that don't include all of that messiness? The answer is yes. <laughs> but yes, you know, really looking at what this slip or what this setback can teach us and use that to move forward. I really believe setbacks, they really strengthen everything that we've learned so far. They are a deep and beautiful lesson that can help us going forward. And while I, my personal story is I, I didn't relapse. I know that's extremely rare. And, you know, I think so much of that came down to also having an incredible uh, husband that reflects back to me all the bad things about drinking. <laughs> and so that really helped. But, you know, like using all of your tools, like really leaning on books, podcasts, online programs, talking to others, doing more things in your sobriety, those things will really help you to, to learn more about what your triggers are, where they lay, and how you can sidestep them in the future, like what you'll do. And writing down an action plan can always be really good for this. Like writing down, okay, 
you know, when I see this person, I tend to end up drinking. Okay. So what could you do differently there? Could you not see that person for a few months until you're stronger in your sobriety? Could you only see that person at for breakfast meetings? <laughs> only see them in the mornings? Could you, you know, go to different things? And this may take practice. You know, when I, I remember in early sobriety, I thought, okay, I'll invite two of my favorite drinking friends out to see a movie. Let's go to the cinema, right? It's this nice, safe thing. What I didn't realize is that I had chosen a cinema that served alcohol. So they ordered a glass of wine each and then sat in the cinema either side of me drinking this wine that I could smell. And it was just like so weird because by that point, the smell of alcohol was a bit gross to me, but it just, it takes practice and don't let these little setbacks throw you off your intentions. Like, okay, that didn't work out. But the next time I organized something, I was sure to choose a cinema that didn't serve alcohol. <laughs> you get a little bit wiser with each setback. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for going through all that. So this, this makes me think of when, you know, a lot of those times you're choosing your friends you're hanging out with or not going to certain events, but for a lot of people, their best drinking buddy is their partner. And so mm -hmm. what, what can someone do if their partner is still drinking and they, you know, they're changing their own drinking, but their partner is still drinking. That's the tough yeah. one. I know. It's extremely tough. And I think so much of this can come down to communication, like really communicating because many of the women that I've helped, they weren't really open with their husband or partner about their intentions. So really sitting down with them and communicating and telling them, you know, this is what I want to do. This is why I want to be on this path. And all I need from you is your love and support. Like that's all I, I can ask and that's all I want. And even if I don't necessarily know what that looks like right now, that's what I need from you. And I think the more that you open up those lines of communication, the more empathy the other person has, the more understanding they have. They feel like they're in your inner circle, which, you know, your partner should be. And they feel like they are on your side as well. And you then know that you have been honest and clear. And even if you don't know what to say, even if your voice shakes, you know, just tell them how you've been feeling and how you, how alcohol has been affecting you. Because quite often, no one understands it as well as we understand how it's been impacting us. Uh, people told me all the time, oh, you don't need to stop drinking. What are you talking about? Like, you're fine. The rest of us drink more than you, which wasn't really true, but... <laughs> Um, I knew how it was impacting me. I knew what it felt like deep down and that I didn't want to keep feeling that way. So explaining that and then also so many of my beautiful clients who've had husbands where their main thing to do on date nights was to go out and have dinner with drinks or go out, you know, drinking together, started to shift their relationship to doing other things together. One couple did um, uh, acrobatic classes, like doing acrobatic <laughs> lessons, which I thought was so fun and creative. Another couple did uh, going for canoeing, like canoeing first thing in the morning. So it, it could be something new, like riding your bicycles around the river. It could be, you, you know, going to do some art class together. It could be, you know, just really thinking outside the box. And it can lead to a beautiful new chapter in your relationship where you're doing something new. You're really freshening it up and trying something new. And when you think about it, like deep down, your partner wants what's best for you. They love you. They want to care and support, support, support you. And if they don't, that's another story. <laughs> that's another conversation. But if, if your relationship is good, then they want that for you. And so finding a way where you can respect each other and, you know, by setting, you can also set some boundaries and say, listen, I, you know, if you want to drink, that's your choice. But please don't bring the alcohol into the home or please don't open them in front of me or please don't leave the bottles here or, you know, just really being forthcoming on, on what you need, what would make it easier for you and then understanding that they're on their own journey. They may take a little bit longer, but you, can, again, can be that trailblazer. You can be the one being the shining example, showing them that it can be fun on the sober side. <laughs> 
Thank you. Yeah, I know. I know that's a tough one for a lot of people. And um, I appreciate just your sharing about that and your tips and what I, I, I would say that a lot of people that are listening to this podcast and maybe they're doing dry January, they're not really sure what they want their relationship with alcohol to look like if they're done, you know, if they're just taking a break or they're done. I know you had at one point talked a lot about moderation versus sobriety. Do you have any thoughts to share about that? Yeah, for me, you know, I went round and around and around with moderation as so many of us have. I made rules around my drinking. If I only drink four nights a week, if I only drink two drinks at a time, if I only do this, if I only do that, what I didn't realize is that it wasn't the third drink that was the problem. It wasn't the third night that was the problem. It was that first drink. That first drink led to everything else. And by staying in moderation, we really keep ourselves like stuck in this same old pattern, this same old like setting rules, breaking them, hating ourselves for it, losing confidence in ourselves, losing self-trust. And by embarking on something new and just saying, I'm just not even going to have that first drink, nothing. I'm not going to have it like at all. And I'm going to focus on a new chapter, a new adventure. Like I just feel like that brings out so much freedom. You're not trying to like hold yourself back. And I think so many of us have the experience of going to an event and saying, oh no, I'm only having three drinks. And then we, 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 the whole night we're on tenterhooks where we don't want to allow ourselves to like let fun, let go and have fun. That's not being carefree. Like I, I thought that alcohol meant being carefree and really sobriety does because once you sort of take that alcohol out of the equation, you're free to just be relaxed, have fun. There's no rules. There's no, you know, there's nothing else besides like, I don't drink anymore. That's it. And, and it just opens up so much space. And instead of then always focusing on the rules, the moderation, the trying to control ourselves, we instead are free to like open up our world and focus on everything else that's out there rather than this sort of like keeping our alcohol, uh, keeping alcohol as our focus. We it, remove it from the equation completely and say, my life is my focus. Yeah, thank you for that. And and I think you do a good job of just like we were talking about, just shining a light on sobriety and how it it is better on the other side. I know it's hard for people to get there. And that's why, like, if you're doing dry, a dry month or taking a break, like, I am just so proud of you for even trying, you know, for even just being open and seeing, like, hmm, is my life better without alcohol? And and really getting honest and curious about that and really leaning into it, like you said, like making your events fun, choosing what you go to, figuring out what you like, all that good stuff is is so helpful. Well, any final words you would say to someone who's listening to this and maybe they're still on the fence about their drinking and maybe they're unsure, maybe they're feeling stuck, what would you say? I would say, I know it's hard to believe that life can be better on the other side. I trust me. I get it. I felt exactly the same way. So find out for yourself, like just give yourself that chance. And I really think three months or a hundred days really can give you that capacity to learn what it feels like to, to discover the clarity, to discover all the good things. And so rather than thinking about not drinking for a hundred days, Think about alcohol-free life for 100 days. No hangovers, no regrets, no tears, no shame. <laughs> None of these things. Just like, what could you do in 100 days? Like, you know, imagine that, that a doctor said you cannot drink for 100 days. Okay, what are you going to do with yourself? Like, how, what are you going to explore? What are you going to learn about yourself? What are you, your new hobbies and interests? So much time opens up for us when we're not drinking. You know, like a... a a seven hour event went by in a flash when we were drinking. When we're sober, it goes so much more slowly. And you also have so much more time with no hangovers. So what could you get up to? Like what adventures could you get up to? Really focus on that because that helps so much to not grieve or like look backwards or to think about alcohol in the drinking days to really focus on the future because, you know, that's where the, the magic lives. Thank you. Well said. 
<laughs> well, I I want to thank you again for coming on and sharing your wisdom. I feel like I was just picking your brain. I I really appreciate you. How can people find you? You can come and find me at bexweller.com and you'll find there uh, my books. And my most recent one is called RSVB Sober, which is a journal that helps you socialize sober. And gosh, I had so much fun making this one. You can write in it. You can make your lists. You can use your, write your action plans. And I really help it. hope it helps you to kick butt at your next social event. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Deb. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Alcohol Tipping Point Podcast. Please share and review the show so you can help other people too. I want you to know I'm always here for you. So please reach out and talk to me on Instagram at Alcohol Tipping Point and check out my website, alcoholtippingpoint.com for free resources and help. No matter where you are on your drinking journey, I want to encourage you to just keep practicing, keep going. I promise you are not alone and you are worth it. Every day you practice not drinking is a day you can learn from. I hope you can use these tips we talked about for the rest of your week. And until then, talk to you next time.